Hello everybody, welcome to Red Toolhouse. On our YouTube channel we talk about all things homesteading and try to implement some of those things on our rural 100 acres here in southern West Virginia. Well today's video, as promised, I wanted to talk about our sawmill. Uh, we did our video last week where we kind of showed our, our operation milling our first log, getting our tree down, that type of thing. Today I want to go over details of our mill, discuss the features, discuss things that I like, things that I may have issues with, and of course discuss the cost in case you all may be considering this mill uh, for your own homestead. So let's jump right into it. So why did we choose the Norwood brand? Well, if you watched last week's video, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, we talked about that, but quite frankly, it just came down to, to two real key reasons. Uh, number one, I've used a Norwood mill before. I've owned a Norwood mill before. Uh, about 18 years ago, the LM um, 2000, or the Lumbermate 2000, I think they called it at that time. Lumbermate 2000, I bought, assembled, had it running here. Uh, traded it to my brother many, many years ago. He has it over at his farm, still running, still operating. We use it uh, all the time over there as well. So I wanted to have something here on site that I could use and, and not have to transport logs back and forth. So naturally with all the success we had with our Lumbermate 2000, it just seemed uh, uh, obvious to me, I wanna try the new Norwood. So, um, so I quickly looked to see where they were price-wise, what their features were, if anything had changed dramatically over the, over the 18 years. And they have had some serious uh, engineering improvements, um, but it, um, it still looked like the mill that I wanted to try out and the price was where I expected it to be. It was, it was roughly, about the same where I was 18 years ago, of course, excluding inflation. And hang on till the end, well, I'll, I'll actually break out the costs of everything um, once we talk about the features and show you what all I got. That way it, it kind of makes sense as to what the cost is. So um, that's, not a, that's not a hook to try to get you to stay along, but it, it just makes sense at the end. We'll discuss the cost so you can see what all the uh, options I've added. Ooh, had to lose a layer there. It's West Virginia fall. If you don't like the temperature, you just wait a couple hours and it'll change. That's how the weather works around here. Okay, so what type of mill do we get? Well, we got the Norwood Lumbermate LM29. And you could probably consider that a mid-grade model. There's the, I think there's the MN26 and then the HD36. HD's heavy duty, a lot, uh, a lot bigger, obviously a lot more expensive. The MN26, a little bit smaller, not as much accessory opportunities there. And uh, so we just, hey, let's go with a mid-grade. Uh, the Lumbermate is what we had before, so it made sense to us. So uh, the 29 designates the fact that it has, let's roll the carriage down here. It has a 29 inch, what I consider a 29 inch throat to handle a 29 inch diameter log. So you can imagine a round log sitting here on this bed. Uh, that's the maximum width, maximum diameter that this mill can handle. Now, as far as boards go, it can create a 22 inch wide board out of that uh, before obviously guides and issues come, come into play. As far as the length goes, the standard LM29 comes with a uh, 16 foot bed that allows you to mill 12 foot 9 inches of log. Again, I don't know who would need specifically a 12 9. Granted that the reason why they do that is that the extra 9 inches allows you for cut off as you get checking or just, you know, if you're like me when you cut a tree down, you got a jacked up wedge out of it. Gives you the opportunity to get a good 12 foot board out of it. Well, as far as a drivetrain or engine, it has, this one has a 14 horsepower Kohler engine, pull start. I may regret that one of these days, but that's what I went with. And it also has, um, it has adjustable blade guides. It takes 144 inch uh, saw blade, um, water tank for, chain for blade lubrication. Obviously covers, these, uh, these are covering up the flywheels, of course, the drive wheels that drive the blade. So it's um, you know, pretty, pretty standard as far as understanding the features. Uh, the function, for those of you, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows, most of you know how sawmill works, uh, how these sawmills work at least. You know, if you go to these big mill plants, uh, the logs are moved and the blade is stationary. So the log comes in and it's, pick, you know, it's picked up and it's moved down a conveyance system and it's milled that way in these, these big processes. With a band mill, uh, it uses a band saw. With a band mill, uh, the log stays stationary. You fix the log in a position. You want it as level as possible. And of course you pass this carriage over it. So everything is based on the height of the blade. That's why uh, your blade parallel to your bed or your, what are, these are called bunks, is, is so important because that's where you want your, your true board. You want everything to be the right 
uh, thickness. If your if your blade or your bed was a little off, then every time you'd mill a one inch thick board, maybe it's one inch on this side and maybe it's three quarter on this side or, or whatever, it, it would get you out of whack. So that's kind of the premise. The key, if you watch our time lapse video uh, from two weeks ago, I believe it was, you'll see there was a lot of time spent at the beginning where I was shimming up this bed on the floor of our wood shop. I wanted to make sure it was completely level and completely true before we started dogging down all these bolts. We really wanted to get that, take the time, do the due diligence to get that secure. So that's the concept. Log stays put, you mill it, cut the first side off, flip it 90 degrees, cut the next side 90 degrees, next side, uh, flip it. You get a square log or, or a cant at that point, I, I think is the proper term. And then you decide what you want to start milling. If you want to start milling certain thicknesses or if you want to cut uh, different widths, then of course you just keep turning and cutting however you want to slice that log up. So what options did I add to the mill? Well, the um, the, the first thing I, I knew I wanted, I wanted the four foot bed extension. So I extended the bed by two additional bunks. So that gives me a total of a 20 foot bed that allows me to mill 16.9 or 16. 16 is all I'm looking for because every once in a while I want a longer board uh, for barn, shed, anything like that. I want to be able to do that. So um, I wanted that extension. So of course that made the mill longer. So you imagine it's like railroad track. You can just lay more track and you can just keep adding four foot extensions as long as you want. I, there's some guys, uh, I saw one for sale, I think it was a Norwood, it was a 30 foot track. A guy just really added a whole bunch of uh, feet to it, or 32, something like that. Whatever four divides into. So uh, you can keep adding those and of course go however long you want. Now, obviously it becomes an issue if you want to trailer it, and that's the next option that I got, was the trailer package. That's why you see these tires here in the jacks. Um, so the trailer package of course allows this to be mobile and allows me to move it around here on the farm. I don't have to have it in one fixed position and figure out how to pick it up and move it. Uh, it's obviously very simple to drop the jacks and roll it out of the way. It's got a trailer hitch on it, hooks up to the side by side, the tractor, the truck, whatever. I can do that. They have a street legal version of this trailer package. I didn't get it. It would include fenders and, and taillights, but obviously West Virginia, we know how that works. Um, so I can move it wherever I want, I guess we'll say. Uh, with, the, uh, with the extension, of course, it required me to get some extra jacks as well. So, you know, extend the bed, got to extend the trailer frame. Uh, another, another option, of course, it, it, was, it was kind of mid-grade, was the, the choice of the Kohler. Uh, Kohler 14 horse I went with instead of the Honda 13 or the Briggs 16 horse V-twin that has the electric start. Now the Briggs is what we have on the Lumbermate 2000 at my brother's place with the electric start. And that's been a real solid engine. Uh, so I may regret, so that was a thousand dollars more, I may regret not having the electric start, but I've been really happy with how this starts so far. Well, other options I added that are kind of independent of the mill, but uh, one I got from Norwood and the other I got local, but um, was the first is this device called the called the grapple and I really like this so far and this this really allows us to pick up some logs pretty easily here we'll spin around here real quick here goes a log now so the way this works obviously I hang it on the chain on the front bucket of my tractor and uh, as I come up over a log the uh, gravity plays its part and just bites down on there so I can I can really clamp down on that log pretty easily and be able to lift it, move it around. So it's neat to you can use it to skid logs out, but primarily the purpose was to be able to pick logs up and set them on the sawmill. And of course, the last tool I needed uh, above and beyond the mill was a good PV. Some of you may call this a can hook. There's actually different varieties of these, but I believe technically this is a PV. Uh, but this again, just allows us, it's got a swinging leg here, a little tip on the end, so you can bite down on the log. And if I wanted to uh, move this log, roll, roll it around, I could, obviously, with my grapple in the way. Uh, then I could move that pretty easily. So, about $100 for these suckers, so they're proud of those. So, operationally, um, again, if you watched last week's video, you saw us using it, so I won't spend too much time on how it works. It's, it, again, it's a pretty simple concept, but, but the key, really, is utilizing these, um, these log rests. When you go to load it. So if you're going to load a log, you want your rests up and uh, you know, locked down. You imagine that's kind of a guardrail 
Um, in this situation where we're using a mechanical advantage, we're using the tractor to load the log, then um, if I set it up here with a bucket, if I'm a one-man operation, then I want to be able to set it up here, let it sit and not roll off, and be able to come out and take the uh, grapple off and get it, get it put, placed in position. If, if you weren't, if you didn't have a tractor and you had to use ramps, because that's what we used, to, that's what I did when I first bought a mill was used ramps, uh, then you got to find a way to roll that up onto your bed. That's why without all these accessories, the bed sits really low to the ground. And I like that if you're, if you don't have a means of lifting up your logs, you want the mill as low to the ground as possible. So you're not having to fight uh, the mechanics and gravity getting that up here. But these log rests help keep the, um, keep the log from rolling off the back. Obviously that would be a drag if you load it from this side and bang, they go off the back. So you load your log, you got your log rests up, and then you have a log dog. And on this one I have a single log dog. And it slides on this center pole here. So depending on the thickness of the log, you can move it over, um, put the rest into position dog this down to the log so it's it stays in that one spot so of course that's all that is doing is just keeping the log secure in one area keep it from moving as you make a pass with your sawmill so you cut that first flitch off that first bark area cut that off obviously sets that to the side and now you've got a flat face so you turn that 90 degrees and press that flat face flush against your log rests so hopefully what that does, if you've, if you've got it flush correctly against these, then you can imagine you're, you've got a flat edge here and you're gonna come back with your sawmill blade and you're gonna cut that next side off. So hopefully that makes this a 90 degree angle. Once you've got that established, then you're in the home, home stretch. Flip it again and now you've got a flat edge laying on the bunk. So whatever you cut is going to be parallel to that bunk. And then you flip it again and hopefully that's parallel, that should be parallel to the second edge. So now you should have a perfect square. If everything's level, if you treat it upright, if you've got it flush here. So uh, at that point, then again, you're, you're ready to start slicing it like you'd be slicing a ham, you know, whatever thicknesses you want. So what do I like about the mill and what issues do I have? Keep in mind, at the time of shooting this video, I've had the mill just a couple weeks. So maybe a fair assessment would be to come back a year from now and of course ask the same questions. And we'll do that, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Well, the first issue isn't really an issue, it's more of a concern. And it's a concern because of me not wanting to get off my wallet. And that's with this Kohler. Uh, Kohler's a good engine, I've, you know, you have issues with all kinds of stuff. But I think this 14 horse is gonna be enough to get the job done. Now granted, I haven't done a 25 inch diameter hickory yet. That'll be the true test. Uh, but I think it's gonna get the job done. I may regret going with a pull start and not having electric ignition. Uh, we'll see, again, it just depends on how much I run this in the winter. It depends on how much I do the maintenance on it to keep it uh, starting easily. So that, that may be a concern, but again, I'm, I've, I've been okay with Kohler for a while. So with building this mill from scratch, literally getting it in a whole bunch of boxes and assembling it may seem tedious and may seem arduous, and it was. It was definitely a tedious task, but it makes you intimately familiar with this piece of equipment. You know, I know, I put in every bolt, I know uh, pretty detailed how things went together, how it works. So that got me thinking about the engineering and having a mill from 18 years ago, has the engineering improved? Does it look like they've uh, changed engineering to improve features or did they change engineering to save money and to cut costs in areas? And quite frankly, what I've seen, it seems like that their engineering has made a lot of improvements. There's really a lot of different things that this mill has that our old mill didn't. So one of the biggest examples of this and what initially was, was I thought was going to be probably the key concern, and again, time will tell, was the bunks, the actual bed uh, of the mill frame. On our old Lumbermate 2000, this wasn't a piece of plate steel with a, with a rolled or bent edge here to make a lip. This was a wide channel stock. Um, it was you know, three or four inches wide hollow channel, but it was just, it just, you look at it, it just looked much beefier. So I saw this, I'm like, oh man, I don't, I'm not sure I like that. But the benefits I see of this right now are uh, issues that we used to run into all the time with the L Lumbermate 2000 was setting the log on here, especially when we started milling pine, where you've got all these knots and you've cut branches off and you've tried to make it as flush as possible. If you end up lining a knot up with one of the wider beds, 
then of course the logs raised up so you got to move it one way or the other sometimes you find well i move it here and now it's lifted up on that end because of the location uh you know of the bed you just can't change that uh, with this obviously a lot less surface area to catch a a, a knot on so uh, won't be that big of a deal uh, could this quarter inch plate steel get bent sure sure it could the only way to get bent though is if I was dropping something on this mill. If I'm dropping logs on this, then I'm going to have a whole lot of other issues, not just a bent uh, bunk here. I'm going to have uh, some serious alignment issues and the mill's just not going to last. So I don't plan on dropping logs or rolling logs off my bucket onto the mill. They, they will get placed easily with the grapple and chain. So probably the biggest engineering change in this mill compared to our old mill is the way you raise and lower the saw, the actual moving blade, this, this carousel, this carriage, if you will. On our old mill, we had a, a crank system that you would raise it and lower it, but then you'd have to have, another, there's another clamp that you would actually dog down. So you'd you kind of get this position based on your guide where you wanted it, and then you'd clamp, you'd turn another knob to clamp this down, and you had to go around to the other side and clamp it down. This thing, actually you just move it wherever you want it. So move it there, move it here, and it stays. And that's awesome. The fact that you don't have to clamp anything down, you've got one hand movement. So man, you can mill as you're backing up, you can be lining up your next, next cut and be ready to pass as soon as, if you've got some help, as soon as somebody's got the, the board cleared. Now, what's the difference here? Well, in the old mill, there was a garage door spring. If these guys are familiar with the garage door spring, it's a big coil spring, it's above your garage door. You, if you've got a garage door, you can go see it. And when I built the old mill 18 years ago, you put that garage door spring in and, and the resistance of it is what helped you raise this mass, this heavy weight of, of all this, the engine and all the other things on it. Well, when you built it, you had to wind that garage door spring up so it would have tension on it. And that was one of the most intimidating things I'd ever done because you have these two uh, uh, sticks, these metal rods that you're using to crank that thing. And man, I just... Uh, it's just one of those things that just make you feel uneasy, thinking, hey, if I let go of this or something slips, that's going to come, you know, come undone, and those rods are going to hit me about 13 times before I can get away from it. Be like Daffy Duck, you know, you end up with my bill on the back side of my head there. <laughs> so so I'm, glad it, I'm glad this doesn't use that engineering. This uses a cable and pulley system. So, uh, of course, using mechanical advantage with a, a pulley allows us to raise and lower. What keeps the weight from drawing this back down is a really interesting cable tensioning system here. And again, I've got covers on it. I'm not taking it apart because if you release the tension on that, it comes slamming down. But there's actually a, a tensioning knob here that you can adjust if you want more or less tension. Um, it, it, it keeps resistance on this knob. And so far, I've been impressed with it. Now, the first cut I did, the first log I did, I did um, make a couple passes and look back and notice that it had settled a little bit. It settled about an eighth of an inch, uh, which was an issue because when I looked at that board, I could actually see the little drop down. So that log went from being certain thickness to an eighth inch thinner. So I'm like, ooh, that, okay, that's not good. But I came back, looked at the instructions, obviously adjust the tension and ran fine. Never had another drop down issue. The, the vibration, the rattling of this, none of that made that carriage sink. And this mill's been sitting here now about three days since I've run it last. And I set it at, the, at a specific height that I could remember. I think I set it at four inches. And I came back uh, today to shoot this to see if it had settled any, and it had not. So three days, it's out in the weather, you know, multiple rain, it's set where, where I had it set. So it, it remained in that position. So while I was a little unsure about that, I love the, that they've eliminated some of these extra steps. And if this tensioning system holds up as good as it has so far, then it's a win-win. It, it makes it a lot more easy to, to raise and lower this. Well, another feature I like that seems kind of simple, but um, didn't have it on our old mill, and there's times that I wish it did, was a kill switch. Just a safety emergency stop. Uh, this is hooked up to the ground system, the oil sensor on typical uh, engines like this. So just uh, slam and shut it down. And that makes it nice. It's just a nice safety feature. I, I like that they've added more safety features to this. I was never in a situation with the old one where I was going to cut an arm off, but if you got something in a jam or in a bind and you're waiting for that, uh, that engine to cycle down, then you could, you could turn this off real easily versus having to reach in and grab the key or that. So I like that kill switch, nice feature. The other is this handle. And if you watched uh, last week's video, talked about it, you can kind of see where the operator's handle is to my chest. I'm at ground height right now because where I have this mill set up has a little bit of a downslope. So I'm not 
that impressed with having this this high, but they've made this adjustable so I can actually undo these four carriage bolts and I can actually rotate this, I think about 15 degrees it looks like. So I can move that, pivot that a certain way. So if, if Kelly or the boys wanted to operate it, which they could, it's very easy to operate, then they could, uh, we could obviously lower it there. On the old mill, it was a handlebar system that was fixed in a specific spot, so you couldn't raise or lower, and you kind of pushed it from behind. So. Well, another feature I really like, and you think may be simple, is the log scale guide. This, this measurement uh, device here that, that obviously helps you determine how high your blade is from the bed. Uh, well, on the old mill, it, it simply had a, a static measurement, basically, and you'd set it up. It was actually put on there with heavy-duty Velcro, so you'd stick it on there, get it calibrated and say, okay, I know my blade is eight inches from the bunk because I took a tape measure and that's where I'm going to put the guide with a little arrow that pointed to eight inches, <laughs> calibrated. Well, that's all you really had to go by. You couldn't, you couldn't move it. You really couldn't, um, if you, by the time you finished your cant and your, uh, you got your square log and it was seven inches and, uh, you know, five sixteenths thick, then you're like, okay, I got to start doing the math. If I want a one inch board, then I need to go, you know, uh, six inches and five sixteenths and five inches and five sixteenths. So you had to always remember that. With this, they've just taken a simple element here and just added a little sliding guide. So you can change the blue line. There's a blue line that marks there and say, okay, once I've got my cant established and I want to do four quarter boards or I want to do six quarter boards, one inch, inch and a half, whatever. Um, then you can set that guide and it's got uh, log scales here. So it's just four, 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 six, 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 eight, 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 nine, 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 three, three, three. So you just go to the next four. If you're doing four, four quarters or, or one inch board, you can just go from the one four to the next four to the next four to the next four. And it just, you're just slicing everything the same. So I really like that. It's amazing how much quicker that allows you to dial this in because there's times I'd start a pass and look, oh no, I needed to go an extra quarter inch because I'm trying to do the math in my head. So simple, yes, but very, very effective. I really like that. So what do I not like about the mill? Well, if you'd asked me this two weeks ago, I would definitely would have said these log rests. I just wasn't, even from the point of assembly, I thought, I just don't know that this is going to be good enough compared to what I was used to on the Lumbermate 2000. Lumbermate 2000 had, I think it was three inch or two inch square tube stock that um, was, was on a pipe system here that you could, you just kind of rotate it out of the way. So when you pushed it up, it was a nice true 90 degrees, big square stock, had some washers on it that would help, this kind of serve as little wheels to help turn the log or not not resist the log and um, those were really really heavy duty and uh, they were fixed they weren't dogged down by this one uh, hand screw so that was that was my first concern when i saw this like, yeah i don't know now again if you'd asked me two weeks ago i'd have really wanted to throw it over the hill because as you can see by this nice little notch i've taken out of it there if you watch last week's video you'll see where knucklehead runs the mill into it and knuckleheads me of course runs the mill into it and of course um, you know, almost cut the tip off of it so at that point i was really aggravated but but that was operator error or what i like to call an id 10t error uh, so once we fix that error then uh, i didn't have that again but after the last two weeks of looking at this using it kind of even watching videos of how guys have used it i see that it actually has a three point use to it uh, you can use it three different ways. So you can see it's got this little extra tab here on it. And what that allows is if you're just starting with your log and you've got an odd shaped log, then you can use that to help push the log away from this rest, but still utilize the rest. And the reason why that becomes important, imagine if you had a log here that had a knot, and we've run into this all the time, yeah, especially when you begin with pine or, or um, cedar or anything like that that's really knotty or had a lot of limbs and maybe you've missed a little nub in there. If it's sticking out beyond this rest and you don't really see it, then, or you've turned it so many times and you're always going to have a, a nub out of there, as you come along with that carriage, you may, that nub end up, may end up hitting the cover and being resi you know, providing resistance and actually stopping the mill from, from continuing its path. So this little tab helps you keep the log centered more in the bed. Obviously, the bigger the log, the, the more it's going to push that way. But I, I like that idea there. When you turn it this way with the little face slope toward the log, 
Then of course it gives you the ability as you're bringing the log in and you actually see here where I'm dropping this log, it gets, gets caught. If I'd done that on the old log rest, it had taken a big chunk out of it and, and maybe it even stayed up in the air until we released it and then you know could have gotten one of us if we were in the way. With this slope, it naturally of course has the log slide off of it and drop down. And lastly, what I did like is you can take this thing and, and you, we, we, Thad and I would just call it bury it. My brother and I, we call it, we bury our, our uh, log guides. But in this situation, when you bury it, it still leaves this tab. As long as nobody cuts the top off of it, it still leaves this tab. So when you have your square cant and you've pushed it over here, then it's going to rest against this and stay in position. Or you can even raise this up a little bit if you wanted to have that. Now again, when you're doing your last cut, make sure you don't cut the top off of it. So I like the fact that it has three functions. The only thing that I'm concerned about is, you know, how long will this thumb screw hold up? And granted, if this thing um, gets brittle because of being out in the sun, um, I'm sure that's not a very expensive replacement. And um, we may find out here in the next week or so what it costs to replace one of these since I you know, ran the blade through it. So that would be one of my, my question marks. Again, not an issue yet. I do like the fact that it's multifunctional more so than the old one, uh, but I don't know if, if I'm completely sold on this. There are other options. There are upgrades uh, actually for this, uh, for this type of guide. So you may be asking, okay, Troy, did you not have any issues with this? Are you going to be all positive and not talk about any negatives? Um, no. I did have some issues. The issues were in the assembly process. Now, again, this, this is no easy task to put this thing together. There's a lot of time involved. I estimate we had about 15 to 18 hours involved in putting this together of actual time. It took me about two months, A, because in my work schedule, I've got other things going on, uh, B, we had a two-week vacation nestled in that time, and C, we did have some issues with getting the right components. And let me explain that. What happened is I put a four-inch, four, put a four-foot extension on the mill and added the trailer package. So the trailer package should have been extended as well. So that was kind of the first issue. Uh, I didn't get all those pieces. And at the same time, these elements here that hold these jacks on uh, evidently, as it was explained to me, they were going through a re-engineering process. Some of the ones I got in were the old ones and some were the newer ones. So they had to swap those out. Um, the last thing that we had was the axle. You can see there's a, here's a nice trailer axle that's mounted to the bottom of this. Well, I spent uh, an hour <laughs> trying to figure out Okay, these, these leaf springs aren't lining up, man. Something's just not right here. I, I'm stupid, but I didn't think I was that stupid. Something's not right. So my father-in-law worked on it for a while. I was like, nope, something's not right. So when I called Norwood and explained it to him, they said, yep, we sent you the wrong axle. And uh, that axle is actually for probably one of the smaller mills. It's like, oh, okay. So I'm not stupid. I, that was an issue. So those were the issues I ran into. So what's my takeaway from that? Well, as a business owner, I am super sympathetic to, uh, to businesses make mistakes. My business makes mistakes. Make, everybody makes mistakes, right? So the, the real test of a business is how did you solve or how did you resolve those mistakes? Well, when it came to the axle, they had a new one sent to me. I got it the very next day. I asked them, do you want the old axle back? No, you keep that old axle because it would cost more to ship it back. And being a farmer, you may have a use for another axle. When it came to these guide elements, Yes, they, they got those parts out immediately. Free shipping, obviously, got those to me because I needed them. Explained the situation, apologized. And because of the delay, there's two, two different shipping pieces that had to come in two different times. And because of that delay and that mix-up, they also sent me a uh, whole other box of 10 blades. Yeah, that's almost 300 bucks by the time you factor in shipping in that. So customer service took care of the issues. And, and to me, that's the thumbs up. And you may say, oh, you're just a Norwood poster child. Yeah. I am impressed with a business. If it makes mistakes, how does it rectify the mistake? And so far, they have done a great job rectifying the mistakes that were made. So assembly process was delayed because of some incompatibility issues during a re-engineering process that they were going through, according to them. And they made the issues go away, they fixed them, and it obviously gave me even some extra to boot. So what did I get out of that? Well, you can't see them here because they're not needed, but I had, I now have a free set of leveling legs. So if I ever wanted to make this a stationary mill, I now have legs that will keep it up off the ground higher. And uh, that's about a $600 attachment. That, I got that for free. 
I obviously got an extra axle for free. And I also got a you know, box of 10 blades. So all in all, I, I netted about $1,000 in that situation uh, in, in extra parts and accessories. Now again, I'm not going to use those legs unless I decide to make this fix. So that probably may not bear any fruit for me, but it is what it is. Okay, those of you that stuck around long enough to get to the cost part, we're there. So what was the cost of this? Now again, I added a lot of accessories and I, I did some things there. So I'll try to break this out and that's why I have my notes here because I don't want to try to remember things and lie to you. So the base model with this Kohler engine, so a 16 foot bed that allows you to cut 12.9 with the Kohler 14 horse, was $4,997. So you could actually start milling for that plus shipping. Shipping on everything I did was about $250. So $5,200 you could be milling. The four foot bed extension, just the bed extension itself was an additional $185. The trailer package with the existing frame, because it actually adds a, an additional frame to this, so the trailer package, the frame, the jacks, the wheels, the axles, blah, 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 was $1,986. And of course, I had an extra $400 expense because I added on. So I got an extra set of jacks, an extension on the frame, uh, so that added an extra $400 to it. And as I mentioned, shipping was about $250. So all in all, I was at about $8,000 to put this mill together. Electric fence. Put this mill together for... Uh, for what you see here. Now again, that doesn't include you know, my, my grapple and the, the PV and some of those other things. Um, there's a couple other little additions I added. But about eight grand for what you see here, this rolling chassis that can do a, up to a 16 foot log. So uh, again, eight grand's eight grand's a lot of money. Uh, but if you wanna get started, the neat thing about this is it's all modular. Um, on the old mill, if I bought the trailer package after the fact, it was going to be a pain in the butt. And that's why it took me a while when I was assembling this to figure out exactly where the trailer came into this. But the way this works is if you had this mill without the trailer assembly and you decided to add that, you can actually just lift this up and build the trailer assembly underneath it or lift this up and set it on the trailer assembly. Um, and by lift, just jack it up. You have some jack center blocks. If you're from West Virginia, of course, everybody's got center blocks in their front yard because that's what you jack your cars up on. So it's something that you can add. You can add these module components as you go along. So if you want to uh, and, you know, do a minimal investment, add to it, then you've got that capability. So you may be saying, well, wait a minute, Troy, aren't you an evil marketing guy? Isn't this all just one big infomercial for Norwood? Well, in full disclosure, I do have a small creator sponsorship deal with Norwood. They don't really call it a sponsorship deal uh, because they do it with other creators as well. But simply because I said I would do a video detailing my experience with their product, then yes, they gave me a little bit of financial uh, incentive. It by no means paid for the mill. I don't want to elude that this was some big, uh, this big contract that we had, but it was an extra little perk that, that obviously helped uh, when it came to out-of-pocket expense. But we both agreed, both Norwood and I agreed, that we only wanted to do this if we did a fair and uh, accurate assessment of the product. So here we go. Uh, I've told you everything that, that I like. I've told you things that I'm concerned about, uh, issues that I had and how they were resolved. We're three weeks into owning this and running it. A year from now, we'll do another video and, and maybe we've run into issues and maybe, maybe not. So I want this to be as fair as possible. And if you have any comments or questions or anything that you would like to ask about the mill, just comment below and we'll address those. Or you can actually send them on our contact form to make sure I see them to, at redtoolhouse.com forward slash contact us. Well, check us out also on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash redtoolhousefarm or at Red Tool House Farm. And Kelly's now on Instagram on the Red Tool House side. Check out at Red Tool House on Instagram. All right, take care, everybody.